a wolfish head, wistful-eyed and frost-rhymed, thrust aside the tent flaps. Hi, Chuck, Siwash, Chuck, you limb of Satan, chorus the protesting inmates. Bettles wrapped the dog sharply with a tin plate, and it withdrew hastily. Louis Savoy refastened the flaps, kicked a frying pan over against the bottom, and warmed his hands. It was very cold without. 48 hours gone, the spirit thermometer had burst at 68 below, and since that time it had grown steadily and bitterly colder. There was no telling when the snap would end. And it is poor policy, unless the gods will it, to venture far from a stove at such times, or to increase the quantity of cold atmosphere one must breathe. Men sometimes do it, and sometimes they chill their lungs. This leads up to a dry, hacking cough, noticeably irritable when bacon is being fried. After that, somewhere along in the spring or summer, a hole is burned in the frozen muck. Into this a man's carcass is dumped, covered over with moss, and left with the assurance that it will rise on the crack of doom, wholly and frigidly intact. For those of little faith, skeptical of material integration on that fateful day, no fitter country than the Klondike can be recommended to die in. But it is not to be inferred from this that it is a fit country for living purposes. It was very cold without, but it was not over warm within. The only article which might be designated furniture was the stove, and for this the men were frank in displaying their preference. Upon half of the floor pine boughs had been cast, above this was spread the sleeping furs, beneath lay the winter's snowfall. The remainder of the floor was moccasin-packed snow, littered with pots and pans and the general impedimenta of an arctic camp. The stove was red and roaring hot, but only a bare three feet away lay a block of ice, as sharp-edged and dry as when first quarried from the creek bottom. The pressure of the outside cold forced the inner heat upward, just above the stove, where the pipe penetrated the roof was a tiny circle of dry canvas. Next, with the pipe always a center, a circle of steaming canvas. Next a damp and moisture exuding ring. And finally, the rest of the tent, side walls and top, coated with a half inch of dry, white, crystal encrusted frost. Oh, 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 a young fellow, lying asleep in the furs, Bearded and W.A.N. and weary, raised a moan of pain, and without waking increased the pitch and intensity of his anguish. His body half lifted from the blankets, and quivered and shrank spasmodically, as though drawing away from a bed of nettles. Roll them over, ordered Bettles, his cramp in. And thereat, with pitiless goodwill, he was pitched upon and rolled and thumped and pounded by half a dozen willing comrades. Damn the trail, he muttered softly, as he threw off the robes and sat up. I've run across country, played quarter three seasons hand running, and hardened myself in all manner of ways. And then I pilgrim it into this godforsaken land and find myself an effeminate Athenian without the simplest rudiments of manhood. He hunched up to the fire and rolled a cigarette. Oh, I'm not whining. I can take my medicine all right. All right. But I'm just decently ashamed of myself. That's all. Here I am, on top of a dirty 30 miles. As knocked up and stiff and sore as a pink tea degenerate after a five mile walk on a country turnpike. Bah, it makes me sick. Got a match? Don't G.I.T. the tantrums, youngster. Bettles passed over the required fire stick and waxed patriarchal. Ye.V.E. got a low sum for the breaking in. Suffering cracky. Don't I recollect the first time I hit the trail? Stiff. I've seen the time it'd take me ten minutes to G.I.T. my mouth from the waterhole and come to my feet every jint cracking and kicking fit to kill. Cramp. 
Insect knots it'd take the camp half a day to untangle me. You're all right. For a cub, any ye the true spirit. Come this day year, you'll walk all us old bucks into the ground any time. And best in your favor. You hain't he got that streak of fat in your makeup which has sent many a husky man to the bosom of Abraham afore his right and proper time. Streak of fat? Yep, comes along of bulk. T ain't the big men as is the best when it comes to the trail. Never heard of it. Never heard of it. Eh, well, it's a dead straight, open and shut fact, and no getting round. Bulk's all well enough for a mighty big effort, but thout staying powers it ain't worth a continental whoop, and staying powers and bulk ain't running mates, takes the small, wiry fellows when it comes to getting right down and hagging on like a lean jowled dog to a bone, why, hell's fire, the big men they ain't in it, by gar, broke in Louis Savoy, that is no, what you call, Josh, I know one man's, so there be like Z Buffalo, wit him, on Z Sulphur Creek Stampede, go one small man's, L.O.N. McFane, you know that L.O.N. McFane, that little Irisher with Z red hair and Z grin, and day walk and walk and walk, all Z day long and Z night long, and big man's, him become there tired, and lay down mooch in ze snow, and little mans keep big mans, and him cry like, what you call ah, what you call ze kid, and little mans keek and keek and keek, and by and by, long time, long way, keep big mans into my cabin, three days for him crawl out my blankets, never I see big squaw like him, no never, him have what you call ze streak of fat, you bet. But there was Axel Gunderson. Prince spoke up, the great Scandinavian, with the tragic events which shadowed his passing, had made a deep mark on the mining engineer. He lies up there, somewhere. He swept his hand in the vague direction of the mysterious east. Biggest man that ever turned his heels to salt water, or run a moose down with sheer grit, supplemented battles. But here's the proof the rule exception, look at his woman, Unger, tip the scales at a hundred and ten, clean meat and nary ounce to spare, she'd bank grit against his for all there was in him, and see him, and go him better if it was possible, nothing over the earth, or in it, or under it, she wouldn't a done. But she loved him, objected the engineer. T ain't that, it. Look you, brothers, broke in Sitka Charlie from his seat on the grub box. Ye have spoken of the streak of fat that runs in big men's muscles, of the grit of women and the love, and ye have spoken fair, but I have in mind things which happened when the land was young and the fires of men apart as the stars. It was then I had concern with a big man, and a streak of fat, and a woman, and the woman was small. But her heart was greater than the beef heart of the man, and she had grit, and we traveled a weary trail, even to the salt water, and the cold was bitter, the snow deep, the hunger great, and the woman's love was a mighty love no more can man say than this. He paused, and with the hatchet broke pieces of ice from the large chunk beside him, these he threw into the gold pan on the stove where the drinking water thawed, the men drew up closer, and he of the cramps sought greater comfort vainly for his stiffened body. Brothers, my blood is red with Siwash, but my heart is white, to the faults of my fathers I owe the one, to the virtues of my friends the other, a great truth came to me when I was yet a boy, I learned that to your kind and you was given the earth that the Siwash could not withstand you, and like the caribou and the bear, must perish in the cold. So I came into the warm and sat among you, by your fires, and behold, I became one of you. I have seen much in my time, I have known strange things, 
and bucked big, on big trails, with men of many breeds, and because of these things, I measure deeds after your manner, and judge men, and think thoughts, wherefore, when I speak harshly of one of your own kind, I know you will not take it amiss, and when I speak high of one of my father's people, you will not take it upon you to say, Sitka Charlie is suwash, and there is a crooked light in his eyes and small honor to his tongue, is it not so? Deep down in throat, the circle vouchsafed its assent. The woman was Pasuk, I got her in fair trade from her people, who were of the coast and whose Chilkat totem stood at the head of a salt arm of the sea. My heart did not go out to the woman, nor did I take stock of her looks, for she scarce took her eyes from the ground, and she was timid and afraid, as girls will be when cast into a stranger's arms whom they have never seen before. As I say, there was no place in my heart for her to creep, for I had a great journey in mind, and stood in need of one to feed my dogs and to lift a paddle with me through the long river days. One blanket would cover the twain, so I chose Pasuk. Have I not said I was a servant to the government? If not, it is well that ye know. So I was taken on a warship, sleds and dogs and evaporated foods, and with me came Pasuk, and we went north, to the winter ice rim of Bering Sea, where we were landed, myself, and Pasuk, and the dogs. I was also given monies of the government, for I was its servant and charts of lands which the eyes of man had never dwelt upon, and messages, these messages were sealed, and protected shrewdly from the weather, and I was to deliver them to the whale ships of the Arctic, ice bound by the great Mackenzie, never was there so great a river, forgetting only our own Yukon, the mother of all rivers, all of which is neither here nor there. For my story deals not with the whale ships, nor the berg-bound winter I spent by the Mackenzie. Afterward, in the spring, when the days lengthened and there was a crust to the snow, we came south, Pasuk and I, to the country of the Yukon, a weary journey. But the sun pointed out the way of our feet. It was a naked land then, as I have said, and we worked up the current, with pole and paddle, till we came to 40 mile, good it was to see white faces once again, so we put into the bank, and that winter was a hard winter, the darkness and the cold drew down upon us, and with them the famine, to each man the agent of the company gave 40 pounds of flour and 20 of bacon, there were no beans, and, the dogs howled always, and there were flat bellies and deep lined faces, and strong men became weak, and weak men died, there was also much scurvy. Then came we together in the store one night, and the empty shelves made us feel our own emptiness the more, we talked low, by the light of the fire, for the candles had been set aside for those who might yet gasp in the spring, discussion was held and it was said that a man must go forth to the salt water and tell to the world our misery. At this all eyes turned to me, for it was understood that I was a great traveller. It is seven hundred miles, said I, to Haines' mission by the sea, and every inch of it snowshoe work. Give me the pick of your dogs and the best of your grub, and I will go, and with me shall go Pasuk. To this they were agreed, but there arose one, Long Jeff, a Yankee man, big-boned and big-muscled, also his talk was big, he, too, was a mighty traveler, he said, born to the snowshoe and bred up on buffalo milk, he would go with me, in case I fell by the trail, that he might carry the word on to the mission, I was young, and I knew not Yankee men, how was I to know that big talk betokened the streak of fat, or that Yankee men who did great things kept their teeth together? So we took the pick of the dogs and the best of the grub, and struck the trail, we three, Pasuk, Long Jeff, and I. Well, 
ye of broken virgin snow, labored at the gee pole, and are not unused to the packed river jams, so I will talk little of the toil, save that on some days we made ten miles, and on others thirty, but more often ten, and the best of the grub was not good, while we went on stint from the start, likewise the pick of the dogs was poor, and we were hard put to keep them on their legs, at the White River our three sleds became two sleds, and we had only come two hundred miles, but we lost nothing, the dogs that left the traces went into the bellies of those that remained, not a greeting, not a curl of smoke, till we made Pelly, here I had counted on Grub, and here I had counted on leaving Long Jeff, who was whining and trail sore, but the fact his lungs were wheezing, his eyes bright, his cash nigh empty, and he showed us the empty cash of the missionary, also his grave with the rocks piled high to keep off the dogs, there was a bunch of Indians there, but babies and old men there were none, and it was clear that few would see the spring. So we pulled on, light-stomached and heavy-hearted, with half a thousand miles of snow and silence between us and Haines' mission by the sea. The darkness was at its worst, and at midday the sun could not clear the skyline to the south, but the ice jams were smaller, the going better, so I pushed the dogs hard and travelled late and early, as I said at forty mile, every inch of it was snowshoe work, and the shoes made great sores on our feet, which cracked and scabbed but would not heal, and every day these sores grew more grievous, till in the morning, when we girded on the shoes, Long Jeff cried like a child, I put him at the fore of the light sled to break trail, but he slipped off the shoes for comfort, because of this the trail was not packed, his moccasins made great holes, and into these holes the dogs wallowed, the bones of the dogs were ready to break through their hides, and this was not good for them, so I spoke hard words to the man, and he promised, and broke his word, then I beat him with the dog whip, and after that the dogs wallowed no more, he was a child, what of the pain and the streak of fat? But Pasuk, while the man lay by the fire and wept, she cooked, and in the morning helped lash the sleds, and in the evening to unlash them, and she saved the dogs, ever was she to the fore, lifting the webbed shoes and making the way easy. Pasuk how shall I say, I took it for granted that she should do these things, and thought no more about it for my mind was busy with other matters, and besides, I was young in years and knew little of women, it was only on looking back that I came to understand. And the man became worthless, the dogs had little strength in them, but he stole rides on the sled when he lagged behind, Parsik said she would take the one sled, so the man had nothing to do. In the morning I gave him his fair share of grub and started him on the trail alone. Then the woman and I broke camp, packed the sleds, and harnessed the dogs. By midday, when the sun mocked us, we would overtake the man, with the tears frozen on his cheeks, and pass him. In the night we made camp, set aside his fair share of grub, and spread his furs. Also we made a big fire that he might see, and hours afterward he would come limping in, and eat his grub with moans and groans, and sleep, he was not sick, this man, he was only trail sore and tired, and weak with hunger, but Pasuk and I were trail sore and tired, and weak with hunger, and we did all the work and he did none, but he had the streak of fat of which our brother Bettles has spoken, further, we gave the man always his fair share of grub. Then one day we met two ghosts journeying through the silence, they were a man and a boy, and they were white, the ice had opened on Lake Labarge, and through it had gone their main outfit, one blanket each carried about his shoulders, at night they built a fire and crouched over it till morning, they had a little flower, 
This they stirred in warm water and drank. The man showed me eight cups of flour all they had, and Peli, stricken with famine, two hundred miles away. They said, also, that there was an Indian behind, that they had whacked fair, but that he could not keep up. I did not believe they had whacked fair, else would the Indian have kept up, but I could give them no grub. They strove to steal a dog the fattest, which was very thin but I shoved my pistol in their faces and told them begone, and they went away, like drunken men, through the silence toward Peli. I had three dogs now, and one sled, and the dogs were only bones and hair, when there is little wood, the fire burns low and the cabin grows cold, so with us, with little grub the frost bites sharp, and our faces were black and frozen till our own mothers would not have known us, and our feet were very sore, in the morning, when I hit the trail. I sweated to keep down the cry when the pain of the snowshoe smote me. Parsik never opened her lips, but stepped to the fore to break the way. The man howled. The thirty mile was swift, and the current ate away the ice from beneath, and there were many air holes and cracks, and much open water. One day we came upon the man, resting, for he had gone ahead, as was his wont in the morning, but between us was open water, this he had passed around by taking to the rim ice where it was too narrow for a sled, so we found an ice bridge, Parsuk weighed little, and went first, with a long pole crosswise in her hands in chance she broke through, but she was light, and her shoes large, and she passed over, then she called the dogs, but they had neither poles nor shoes, and they broke through and were swept under by the water. I held tight to the sled from behind, till the traces broke and the dogs went on down under the ice. There was little meat to them, but I had counted on them for a week's grub, and they were gone. The next morning I divided all the grub, which was little, into three portions, and I told Long Jeff that he could keep up with us, or not as he saw fit, for we were going to travel light and fast, but he raised his voice and cried over his sore feet and his troubles, and said harsh things against comradeship, Pasek's feet were sore, and my feet were sore a, eh? sorer than his, for we had worked with the dogs, also, we looked to see, long Jeff swore he would die before he hit the trail again, so Pasek took off a robe, and I a cooking pot and an axe, and we made ready to go, but she looked on the man's portion, and said, it is wrong to waste good food on a baby, he is better dead, I shook my head and said no that a comrade once was a comrade always, then she spoke of the men of forty mile, that they were many men and good, and that they looked to me for grub in the spring, but when I still said no, she snatched the pistol from my belt, quick, and as our brother Bettles has spoken, Long Jeff went to the bosom of Abraham before his time. I chided Parsuk for this, but she showed no sorrow, nor was she sorrowful, and in my heart I knew she was right. Sitka Charlie paused and threw pieces of ice into the gold pan on the stove. The men were silent and their backs chilled to the sobbing cries of the dogs as they gave tongue to their misery in the outer cold. And day by day we passed in the snow the sleeping places of the two. Ghosts Pasek and I and we knew we would be glad for such a we made salt water. Then we came to the Indian, like another ghost, with his face set toward Peli. They had not whacked up fair, the man and the boy, he said, and he had had no flour for three days. Each night he boiled pieces of his moccasins in a cup, and ate them. He did not have much moccasins left, and he was a coast Indian, and told us these things through Pasuk, who talked his tongue. He was a stranger in the Yukon, and he knew not the way, but his face was set to Peli. How far was it? Two sleeps, ten, a hundred he did not know, 
but he was going to Pelly. It was too far to turn back. He could only keep on. He did not ask for grub, for he could see we, too, were hard put. Parsuk looked at the man, and at me, as though she were of two minds, like a mother partridge whose young are in trouble. So I turned to her and said, this man has been dealt unfair. Shall I give him of our grub a portion? I saw her eyes light, as with quick pleasure, but she looked long at the man and at me, and her mouth drew close and hard, and she said, No, the salt water is afar off, and death lies in wait. Better it is that he take this stranger man and let my man Charlie pass. So the man went away in the silence toward Pelly. That night she wept. Never had I seen her weep before, nor was it the smoke of the fire, for the wood was dry wood, so I marveled at her sorrow, and thought her woman's heart had grown soft at the darkness of the trail and the pain. Life is a strange thing, much have I thought on it, and pondered long, yet daily the strangeness of it grows not less, but more. Why this longing for life? It is a game which no man wins. To live is to toil hard, and to suffer sore. Till old age creeps heavily upon us and we throw down our hands on the cold ashes of dead fires. It is hard to live. In pain the babe sucks his first breath. In pain the old man gasps his last. And all his days are full of trouble and sorrow. Yet he goes down to the open arms of death, stumbling, falling, with head turned backward, fighting to the last, and death is kind, it is only life, and the things of life that hurt, yet we love life, and we hate death, it is very strange. We spoke little, Pasuk and I, in the days which came, in the night we lay in the snow like dead people, and in the morning we went on our way, walking like dead people, and all things were dead, there were no ptarmigan, no squirrels, no snowshoe rabbits, nothing, the river made no sound beneath its white robes, the sap was frozen in the forest, and it became cold, as now, and in the night the stars drew near and large, and leaped and danced, and in the day the sun dogs mocked us till we saw many suns, and all the air flashed and sparkled, and the snow was diamond dust, and there was no heat, no sound, only the bitter cold and the silence, as I say, we walked like dead people, as in a dream, and we kept no count of time, only our faces were set to salt water, our souls strained for salt water, and our feet carried us toward salt water, we camped by the Tarkina, and knew it not, our eyes looked upon the white horse, but we saw it not, our feet trod the portage of the canyon, but they felt it not, we felt nothing, and we fell often by the way, but we fell, always, with our faces toward salt water, our last grub went, and we had shared fare, Pasuk and I, but she fell more often, and at Caribou Crossing her strength left her, and in the morning we lay beneath the one robe and did not take the trail, it was in my mind to stay there and meet death hand in hand with Pasuk, for I had grown old, and had learned the love of woman, also, it was eighty miles to Haines' mission, and the great Chilkoot, far above the timberline, reared his storm-swept head between, but Parsuk spoke to me, lo, with my ear against her lips that I might hear, and now, because she need not fear my anger, she spoke her heart, and told me of her love, and of many things which I did not understand. And she said, You are my man, Charlie, and I have been a good woman to you, and in all the days I have made your fire, and cooked your food, and fed your dogs, and lifted paddle or broken trail, I have not complained, nor did I say that there was more warmth in the lodge of my father, or that there was more grub on the chilkat. When you have spoken, I have listened, when you have ordered, 
I have obeyed, is it not so, Charlie? And I said, A, it is so. And she said, When first you came to the Chilkat, nor looked upon me, but bought me as a man buys a dog, and took me away, my heart was hard against you and filled with bitterness and fear, but that was long ago, for you were kind to me, Charlie, as a good man is kind to his dog, your heart was cold, and there was no room for me, yet you dealt me fair and your ways were just, and I was with you when you did bold deeds and led great ventures, and I measured you against the men of other breeds, and I saw you stood among them full of honor, and your word was wise, your tongue true, and I grew proud of you, till it came that you filled all my heart, and all my thought was of you, you were as the midsummer sun, when its golden trail runs in a circle and never leaves the sky, and whatever way I cast my eyes I beheld the sun, but your heart was ever cold, Charlie, and there was no room. And I said, it is so, it was cold, and there was no room, but that is past. Now my heart is like the snowfall in the spring, when the sun has come back, there is a great thaw and a bending, a sound of running waters, and a budding and sprouting of green things, and there is drumming of partridges, and songs of robins, and great music, for the winter is broken, Pasuk and I have learned the love of woman. She smiled and moved for me to draw her closer, and she said, I am glad. After that she lay quiet for a long time, breathing softly, her head upon my breast. Then she whispered, The trail ends here, and I am tired. But first I would speak of other things. In the long ago, when I was a girl on the Chilkat, I played alone among the skin bales of my father's lodge, for the men were away on the hunt, and the women and boys were dragging in the meat. It was in the spring, and I was alone. A great brown bear, just awake from his winter's sleep, hungry, his fur hanging to the bones in flaps of leanness, shoved his head within the lodge and said, Oh, oh, F. My brother came running back with the first sled of meat and he fought the bear with burning sticks from the fire, and the dogs in their harnesses, with the sled behind them, fell upon the bear, there was a great battle and much noise, they rolled in the fire, the skin bales were scattered, the lodge overthrown, but in the end the bear lay dead, with the fingers of my brother in his mouth and the marks of his claws upon my brother's face, did you mark the Indian by the Pelly trail? his mitten which had no thumb, his hand which he warmed by our fire, he was my brother, and I said he should have no grub, and he went away in the silence without grub. This, my brothers, was the love of Pasuk, who died in the snow, by the caribou crossing, it was a mighty love, for she denied her brother for the man who led her away on weary trails to a bitter end, and, further, such was this woman's love, she denied herself, ere her eyes closed for the last time she took my hand and slipped it under her squirrel skin parka to her waist, I felt there a well filled pouch, and learned the secret of her lost strength, day by day we had shared fare, to the last least bit, and day by day but half her share had she eaten, the other half had gone into the well filled pouch, and she said, this is the end of the trail for Pasuk, but your trail, Charlie, leads on and on, over the great Chilkoot, down to Hain's mission and the sea, and it leads on and on, by the light of many suns, over unknown lands and strange waters, and it is full of years and honors and great glories, it leads you to the lodges of many women, and good women, but it will never lead you to a greater love than the love of Pasuk. And I knew the woman spoke true, but a madness came upon me, and I threw the well-filled pouch from me, and swore that my trail had reached an end, till her tired eyes grew soft with tears, and she said, Among men has Sitka Charlie walked in honor, 
and ever has his word been true. Does he forget that on an owl, and talk vain words by the caribou crossing? Does he remember no more the men of forty mile, who gave him of their grub the best, of their dogs the pick? Ever has Parsuk been proud of her man, let him lift himself up, gird on his snowshoes, and begone, that she may still keep her pride. And when she grew cold in my arms I rose, and sought out the well-filled pouch, and girt on my snowshoes, and staggered along the trail, for there was a weakness in my knees, and my head was dizzy, and in my ears there was a roaring, and a flashing of fire upon my eyes, the forgotten trails of boyhood came back to me, I sat by the full pots of the potlatch feast, and raised my voice in song, and danced to the chanting of the men and maidens and the booming of the walrus drums, and Parsik held my hand and walked by my side, when I lay down to sleep, she waked me, when I stumbled and fell, she raised me, when I wandered in the deep snow, she led me back to the trail, and in this wise, like a man bereft of reason, who sees strange visions and whose thoughts are light with wine, I came to Hain's mission by the sea. Sitka Charlie threw back the tent flaps, it was midday, to the south, just clearing the bleak Henderson divide, poised the cold disked sun, on either hand the sun dogs blazed, the air was a gossamer of glittering frost, in the foreground, beside the trail, a wolf dog, bristling with frost, thrust a long snout heavenward and mourned. In conclusion, Grit of Women by Jack London is a story that not only entertains, but also imparts valuable lessons about the determination and resilience of women. I hope that this video has been an enjoyable and informative experience for you, and has helped you improve your English through storytelling. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more amazing stories. Thank you for watching, and see you in the next video.